Well, thank you for joining us this evening for our Sunday evening service. We are going to be in the Old Testament again. I think it's an unwritten rule that Sunday nights can only be Old Testament. So we're going to be Psalm 95 tonight. Please open your Bibles to Psalm 95. So before my wife and I were married, we uh, went to a restaurant, and I was trying really hard to impress, impress her, really liked her, wanted her to think highly of me. So we went to the uh, melting pot. If you're familiar with the melting pot, pretty expensive restaurant. Uh, I didn't, didn't have any business going there at that time, uh, but I wanted to impress this girl, so we went to the melting pot for a special occasion. And if you've been to the melting pot, they have uh, really good fondue. Uh, the dessert is why you go there. They have chocolate fondue. You, you dip all these things into the chocolate. So that's why you go to the melting pot. So we go through this dinner, really expensive dinner, get to the dessert, and uh, the, wait, the waitress asks us if we'd like peanut butter in the chocolate fondue. And I say, of course, double peanut butter, please. Like, who would not want peanut butter in their dessert? Well, it turns out that there are people in this world that don't like peanut butter in their dessert. Uh, one of them happens to be my wife. So um, spend all this money trying to impress her and just, just blow it. Uh, Thankfully, she was kind. Obviously, it worked out. But I was, uh, I was thinking about that story and just thinking about, uh, you know, that's kind of a, a silly example, but just thinking about our relationship to the Lord, uh, how we might do things that we think would impress God. We might work hard to think we're going to impress the Lord. He's going to be impressed with our worship and then God not be impressed. We actually miss the mark. We totally miss what would please God. So we're going to look at tonight, what about our worship pleases God? We're going to look at worship that God accepts so that we're not consumed with activities, different things that we could do, religious things, go to church, pray, sing songs, and think that we're worshiping the Lord, but not actually worship, miss actual worship of God. And Psalm 95 gives us a template for worship. It's going to lay out for us what worship should look like. See, the Psalms are great, timeless truths. They are uh, Israel's songbook, their hymn book. So we get to, to look at what Israel was singing about as they worship the Lord. And it's going to help us evaluate our worship. It's going to help us grow in our worship. It's going to help us make sure that we are worshiping in a way that God is pleased with. So we're going to look tonight at distinctives of worship that God approves. Distinctives of worship that God approves. So we don't miss the mark. So we don't do all these church activities and find out that we are not actually worshiping. So read with me Psalm 95. O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As at Meribah, as in the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation, and said they are a people who err in their heart, and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, truly they shall not enter into my rest. We see this psalm as a call to worship, a collective call. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us sing together. Let us enter his presence. These are the, the people of God calling each other to worship. You could imagine the Israelites going to the temple to worship, saying, come together, let's worship the Lord. Let's enter his presence. Let's bring worship that's fitting for our king. And we're going to see what kind of worship is fitting to God. We're going to look at three distinctives of worship that God approves. First distinctive of worship that God approves, it is marked 
by sincere praise of God's character. Worship that God approves is marked by sincere praise of God's character. Look at verses 1 and 2. They're going to show us what genuine praise looks like. Not just words, but a heart of worship. It says, let us sing for joy. Let us shout joyfully. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Shouting joyfully with psalms of praise. The psalmist is saying, look away from yourself. Look away from your circumstances. Look away from anything that steals your affections and your attention. And look to the Lord. Praise him. And here's how he says to praise the Lord. He says, sing joyfully. He says to do it with thanksgiving, with psalms of praise. He's saying you must come with thankful hearts, with joyful hearts. This is the attitude of worship, a sincere heart. No pretense, no ulterior motives, not thinking about other things or other people, but just praising God for who he is, marveling at his character with thankfulness. Hearts that sing triumphantly, this is the posture of worship that we see first here is thankfulness. Think about the opposite. Think about when we complain, when you lack thankfulness, when you're not joyful. You are saying, God, there is something about your character that should be different. There is something about your control, your good, sovereign control of all things that that should look different. That's what we're saying when we complain. You are saying, you must bend your plans to my plans, and then I'll be thankful. You see, the right attitude of worship here is thankful, joyful hearts, worshiping God's character. And the psalmist is going to show us in the next several verses why we should worship God like this. Why should we praise him with thankful hearts? For the Lord is a great God, a king above all gods. The psalmist is going to show us God's rule over kings, over nations. In verse 3, when he says a great king above all gods, he's not validating idol worship. He's not saying God is just one God amongst many other gods, and he's the greatest. In the Old Testament, when we see this God above other gods, God is saying he is greater than the gods of the nations. He's saying all these pagan deities, all these pagan kings, who all, all these people worship, our God is greater. He is the only God. Smith has brought this out in Daniel several times. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, when he, when he destroys Jerusalem, he destroys the temple. He takes the, the articles from the temple to prove that he is the, the ultimate ruler. Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I am more powerful than your God. My nation rules over your nation. Remember what Nebuchadnezzar said in Daniel 3, in the fiery furnace. He said to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, What God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? That's Nebuchadnezzar's challenge, that he is the ruler of the nations. Or listen to this example. This is in 2 Kings 18. The king of Assyria swarms Jerusalem Assyria, after they have conquered the northern kingdom, they come to siege Jerusalem, and they say to Hezekiah, this taunt in 2 Kings 18, you can listen. He says, Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Henna, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? See, the king is taunting, is saying, all these other nations, I am greater than them. I have conquered their gods. And then he says, who among all the gods of the land have delivered their lands out of my hand, that Yahweh should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? So you see in the Bible, when when God is saying he is the, the God above all gods, he is saying that he is the God above nations, above any rivals, above all the kings of the earth. And we need to hear this again today, don't we? that God is is king over kings, that God is king over nations, over presidents, over dictators. God is the king over wars. He is sovereign over those things. He rules over those things. And the psalm moves from God's rule over the nations to God's rule over creation. Look at verses 4 and 5. The psalmist says that God holds the depths of the earth in his hand. And he owns the highest mountain peaks. 
This is God's ownership of all things created, from the heights to the depths. You think about Mariana's Trench, the deepest part of the ocean. This scar in the Pacific Ocean is 1,500 miles long, 45 miles wide, 7 miles deep. When they went to the bottom, there's one expedition that made it to the bottom of Mariana's Trench, and they found sea creatures, living creatures, swarming in the bottom of Mariana's Trench. And God is saying that he is king over all those things. He controls the, the sea creatures where no one has seen, where no light touches. He rules those things. I really enjoy watching uh, nature documentaries. Our kids say, hey, let's watch a movie. And I say, let's turn on planet Earth. And then they groan. Uh, but the reason I like to, to watch those shows is because you see God's power over creation. You see these, these ecosystems that no man has touched, the jungles and the deserts. And it just shows God's raw power, his creative power. We went hiking uh, up in Flagstaff recently at Walnut Canyon National Monument. And in Walnut Canyon, they have Pueblo ruins that are in the side of the, the mountain range. And these Pueblo Indians, they actually carved their, their shelters into the mountains 700 years ago. And as we were staring out over these mountain ranges, and you see these different houses that have stood there for 700 years, it struck me that the, the mountains are still standing. Even the houses are still there 700 years later. And you think about the generations of people that have come and have died, and God is just holding those mountains. It makes us feel small when we think about God's bigness, his rule over creation. In verse 5, the psalmist points to God's creative power. He made the sea. His hand formed the dry land. This is almost word for word from Genesis 1, when God separated the waters from the land, and he called the, the dry land earth, and he called the water sea. And our response to all of this, our response to God's creative power is to praise him, to have sincere worship, thankfulness, to have joy over the sovereign king. This should move us to praise God's creative power, his sovereign control, and it's one thing for us to praise a, an all-powerful God. And God is praiseworthy because of his power in itself. But if God were just all-powerful, that would not be good news for us. That would be scary for sinners if God were only just powerful. We find out in this psalm, God is not just all-powerful, that God also lowers himself to man. He actually relates to humans. He's actually the God of a certain people. That's going to bring us to our second distinctive of worship that God approves. First distinctive of worship that God approves is marked by a sincere praise of God's character. Second distinctive is it is marked by humble remembrance of God's provision. A humble remembrance of God's provision. The God who holds the universe in his hands cares for people. He cares for his people. Look again in verse 6. Come, again, the, the call heightens, the momentum builds. You have seen God's work in creation, the psalmist is saying. Now come, bow before your king. Bow and kneel, they say in verse 6, like a, a servant before a king, bowing low, putting their face to the ground. This is a posture of humility. This should be our response to God's character. We bow down, we see how big God is, and we see how small we are. One pastor said it this way, he said, no one goes to the Grand Canyon and says, look how big I am. You don't look up at the night sky and see millions of stars and think, man, I am so impressive. When you see how big God is, that should make us feel small. We should see ourselves rightly. We should be humbled. There are not any redeemed people that are not humble. Omri brought it out this morning in Zephaniah that in order to be saved, those that will be saved from God's judgment are those that are humble, the humble people of the earth. Think about in Luke 18, the, the parable of the, the tax collector and the Pharisee. Remember the, the tax collector that's repentant. He prays with his face in this posture, bowed low. He won't even look up to heaven. He beats his chest and he says, be merciful on me, the sinner. That's the posture of worship. Humility before God. Seeing our need. This is how we praise God with humble reverence. 
And the psalmist again moves from how we praise God to why we praise him. Why do we praise him this way? For, verse 7, he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. This is relational language. God created all things, and he relates to man. The God who made the sun and the stars condescended to make himself known. This is why we bow before him, because he provides for us. He provides for sinners. He makes covenant with sinners. Verse 7, he says, We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. This majestic, all-powerful king is also a gentle shepherd. He leads his people. He provides for his people. We see this shepherd-sheep language all throughout Scripture. The idea of a shepherd is one who leads, one who protects, one who provides. This is active, personal care. And we are sheep. Sheep can't even find their own food. They can't protect themselves from enemies. They are helpless creatures. We sing tonight, Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. Or think about Jesus' words. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. God has provided spiritual life for his people. Look what he says. He says, we are the sheep of his hand in verse 7. Verse 4, he said that God's hand holds the depths of the earth. Verse 5, he said God used his hand to, to spread out the waters to form dry ground. And now he says that God's hand, his powerful hand, holds his people. He cares for them. William Plummer says this of God's power that should comfort us. He says, if an atom or an agent of life or death, if Satan or Gabriel, if the sea or the dry land, the mountaintops or the deep abysses were beyond divine control, then a good man might suffer too much for his good. He might be tried beyond the power of endurance or die before his time. But now such things are not possible. That's what the psalmist is saying. We worship God because of his provision, because of his care for us, a gentle shepherd that cares for us. And the psalmist here has been taking us to these heights, these great realities about God, about his character, about his care. And the psalm here is about to take a, a sharp turn. It's like a, a roller coaster. You're going up, click, 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 getting to the top, seeing the heights here, praising God's character, praising his providence, praising his care for his people. And now we're at the top, and it, and it takes a turn. The psalmist is setting a hook here. He's saying, God's great character. You love that. Yes and amen. He is creator. He is covenant keeper. He provides for you. And now, do not harden your heart. He's saying, you are accountable now. You are accountable for what comes next because God is creator. Because he is covenant keeper, do not harden your hearts. Notice the change in who is speaking. Verses 1 through 7, it's the let us, let us. And now he's saying, you must do this. It's as if the worshipers are approaching God's temple. They're saying, let us do this together. Let us worship God. And now God is answering back to them. If you would come for worship, this is how you must worship. Verse 7, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If you would hear God's voice. To listen to God's voice, this is obedience language. To hear God's voice is to, to respond in humble faith and then to obey. You could say yes and amen to the first two points. And now the psalmist is saying, let me test what you are saying. It's easy to say, yes, God is good. That's a beautiful sunrise. It's easy to say, yes, God is love. I'm his child. But how about obedience? What do we do when he speaks? Do we obey? God is saying here, don't tell me, show me. That's our third distinctive of worship that God approves. Third distinctive of worship that God approves is demonstrated by soft-hearted obedience to God's word. We saw some sincere praise first, humble remembrance, and now we see that worship is demonstrated, it's proved by soft-hearted obedience. By obeying what God says. So how do you know if you are a worshiper? 
Do you believe what God says? Do you obey it? This third distinctive comes to us as a warning. This is a warning to not be complacent, to not let unbelief grow in your heart. This is a warning to to press on in faith. He's saying, do not put your faith in cruise control. Today, you must do this. Every time God speaks, again, you must respond in faith. You must believe. And then you must obey. We find out here there is danger for us. There's actually danger of spiritual privilege. A danger of seeing God work. Of hearing his word. And being unimpressed. And the psalmist is going to press this point home for us by giving us an example of unbelief. He's going to show us an example of spiritual pretense. He's going to give us an example of of worship that God does not accept. And he takes us to Exodus, to the wilderness generation. This is the generation of Israelites that God freed from Exodus. They crossed the Red Sea with Moses. And this generation is going to be a warning for us. A warning against unbelief. And God's going to take us to a specific time and place with this generation, a specific time to highlight their unbelief. You think about in relationships, for those of you that are married, you think about just special places for your relationship, maybe the spot where you proposed, where you had your first date, maybe a honeymoon destination. This place had such special significance for us, that restaurant. Well, God here says there is a special place that sums up his relationship with Israel. There's a special place that sums up his relationship with this Exodus generation, and it's called Massa and Meribah. I want you to turn to Exodus 17. Exodus 17, beginning in verse 1. The people have just left the promised land. I mean, they've just left Egypt, rather. They had this miraculous escape. The ten plagues. God parts the Red Sea. He's already given them manna from heaven. This bread that he just provides from the sky for them to eat. And right after that, we're going to see how they respond. Exodus 17.1 Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do to this people? A little more and they will stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. In verse 7, he named that place Massa and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel. And because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? You can turn back to to Psalm 95. Psalm 95 picks up this event as a warning, this grumbling against God. Massa means to test. Meribah means to complain or to quarrel. And these words now become this geographic marker. That place is now called testing and complaint. The, the, the road signs here, Massa Meribah, testing complaint. This is where you tested and complained. This event here is used to highlight their idolatry, their unbelief. And you know how this story unfolds. If you'd actually turn to, to Numbers chapter 14. We know what happens to this generation. They complain against the Lord. They grumble against his good care for them. Then we get to Numbers 14. And they're on the the edge of Kadesh Barnea. They're on the edge of the promised land. They're ready to enter the land. God has brought them out out of Egypt. He has provided for them in the wilderness. He has given his law. He has revealed himself to Moses and to the people on Mount Sinai. 
And you remember the story. They send out 12 spies into the land. And the 12 spies return. 10 of them say, there are giants in the land. There are massive armies in the land. We can't do it. We have to go back, right? Joshua and Caleb say, well, we have God on our side. They have giants and they have armies. We have the God who just parted the Red Sea, who just crushed Pharaoh's army. And they don't go into the land. They reject God's good provision for them. They refuse. And here is what God says to them. Numbers 14, verse 22. Numbers 14, 22. God says, Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice. We find out that Mass and Meribah was just one out of ten situations. He goes on to say in verse 23, They shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurn me see it. Down to verse 26. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, who are grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses will fall in this wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number, from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Verse 30, Surely you shall not come into the land which I swore to settle to you, except Caleb and Joshua. You see, two, two men out of an entire generation get to enter the land. The whole generation of adults dies in the wilderness because of their unbelief. So back in Psalm 95, when this generation is used as an example to say, today, if you hear his voice, do not be like them. Do not test God. Do not reject his word. Verse 90 says, they saw me. They saw my works. Think about this. They saw God's raw power on display, his creative power. They saw it. They saw the 10 plagues of, of, in Egypt. They saw the gnats and the frogs. They saw the water turn to blood, the boils and the darkness. They saw God kill all the firstborn sons of Egypt. They saw God part the Red Sea. They saw him use his mighty hand to move the waters. And they were not convinced. They tell, they tell God what they think will be really compelling. They say, this is what we think will be really satisfying. We will tell you what will make us happy. The issue here is they had discontented hearts. They are saying, we need this circumstance to change. We need this issue to change. And then we'll be happy. And we know this, circumstances are not the issue. Circumstances just reveal what's already going on in our heart. Circumstances just press us. They squeeze out what's already there. In verse 9, it says, they saw his works and they tested they tested God even though they saw his works. They saw all these miracles and they still tested God. They tried him. They questioned him. They put God on trial. They are saying, God, God, why does it have to be this way? You must explain to us. You must answer to us, God. We have this conversation with our kids about what's the, the right kind of way to, to ask a question. All right, when you ask a question and say, Mom and Dad, why do we have to do this? Say, so that's, that's not a question anymore. That's a complaint. You're no longer asking us. You're actually telling us that you don't want to do it. But that's the same thing going on here. They're putting God to the test. They're questioning his authority. They're saying, you must explain it to us. They're saying, God, you must tell us as equals. You must convince us. They're saying, God must do the things that they think would be best. Let me tell you how to run your universe, is what they're saying. And it's easy to look at the Israelites here and say, man, they are so discontent. And then to think about our own lives and just subtle complaints when things don't go our way, when we have missed expectations, we have hard conversations, something doesn't go according to our plan, and we grumble, we complain. And that's grumbling against God's good provision 
Remember back in verse 2, it said to enter God's presence with thanksgiving. The opposite of that is complaint. Complaining is testing the Lord. Grumbling against God is testing him. You are saying in that moment that God should bend his sovereign will to your will. That's the opposite of hearing God's voice. That's the opposite of obedience. Obedience is bending your will to God's will. Complaint is wanting God to bend his will to your will. And look at God's assessment. Verse 10. He says, For 40 years I loathed that generation. God is actually disgusted. He hates this generation. He is angry at this generation because of their sin, their rebellion. And all of them die in the wilderness. Verse 10, because they err in their hearts. They are a people who err in their hearts. We think of this generation as those that wandered in the wilderness. Well, here the psalmist says they're actually wanderers of heart. In their heart they wander. This outward rebellion, this grumbling was a heart issue. They had hard hearts. They had fleshly desires. They had carnal desires. That's what's going on. This is unbelief in the hearts. They don't have hearts that are devoted to the Lord. What would it look like to have a a soft-hearted obedience? What would it look like for them to to obey God? What would it look like Joshua and Caleb? right? To look at all the nations and say, we have God on our side. They just have horses and spears. And we have the Lord. That would be humble faith. To trust what God says over what you see, over what you feel. And for us to to say, I have a a soft heart towards scripture. I believe it. And then to walk away unchanged means that you aren't actually believing it. This is a warning here. This wilderness generation is, is a model of unbelief. They heard God's word. They saw God's work and they were not impressed. So he says, today, whoever hears God's voice today, respond in faith. Believe him, obey him. And this is a warning to those with spiritual privilege, those that are hearing God's word. This is a warning to the church. God says that rebellion is to to hear his word and be unconvinced by it. He says, whenever God speaks, obey. In verse 10, first he says they err in their hearts. And then he goes on to say, they do not know my ways. God's ways, this is his character. This is what he is, who he is and what he does. All of God, his actions, his attitudes, his attributes. He says, they do not know my ways. They miss the first seven verses of this psalm. We find out this is a worship issue. They don't know God's ways. They don't appreciate his character. Who God is does not compel them. If you are worshiping God's character, if you're exalting in his salvation, you wouldn't need this warning. If we really saw God rightly and said the God who created all things sent his son to die for sinners and he spoke to us, he gave us instructions, how could we not obey those things? We must obey. If we are looking rightly at God's character, We will obey. But their sin here, their hard-heartedness, has blinded them from God's character. It has blinded them from praise. So we see here that addressing unbelief, addressing sin in the heart, is actually a matter of worship. When we disobey, when we grumble even, we are not worshiping in those moments. See, the mark of a worshiper is obedience to God's word, hearing his voice, submitting to it in humble faith. If you don't embrace God's word, you are not a worshiper. You are missing the mark on worship. So we ask the question, what is the measure of worship? What is worship that God approves? Your response to his word. That is the ultimate sign of worship. What do you do when God speaks? Or to say it this way, the measure of your love for God is how you respond to his word. For someone to say, I had a great quiet time this morning. God really spoke to me. It was just really impactful. It was really encouraging. And then they go off to their day, unmoved. Same sin struggle, 
same discontentment in the heart. There's something missing there. You are not believing what you are reading. You see, we could show up at church. We could feel like we are worshiping God. We could sing songs. Feel like, man, worship was good today. And then we hear God's word preached and go away unmoved, unchanged, making foolish decisions. Then you have to ask, were we actually worshiping? It's easy to say, I love God's attributes. I love that he controls all things. It's easy to say that. But obedience will demonstrate whether or not we believe that. You cannot say, I love God's holiness, but I have no desire to be holy. I love God's patience to me. I love that God is so kind to me, but I have no desire to be kind myself. I love his goodness. I don't want to be good. As you see this this psalm unfold, you see that God's attributes, his character demands our obedience. The fact that he is creator, the fact that he is king, the fact that he saves sinners, this deserves obedience. And on the flip side, think about it positively. What will fuel our obedience? What will fuel our faith? God's attributes, his character, meditating on who God is, on what he does, seeing truths about God from the scripture. You have this whole generation of men and women, minus two, Joshua and Caleb, the only two that survived, the only two that embraced God's word in faith. They grumbled. They didn't believe. And the psalm ends in verse 11 with the the curse that we saw in Numbers 14. God swearing, verse 11, in his anger. Makes a covenant here with his anger as the witness. He says, truly they shall not enter into my rest. They shall not enter into my rest. This is interesting language here. Because in Numbers 14, God said, they shall not come into the land. And now we see in Psalm 95, he says, they shall not enter my rest. So we see that God is equating the land, the promised land, with God's own rest. He says, my rest. There's more going on here than God just preparing a a nice home for the Israelites. We see this word rest. You think of the Garden of Eden. You think of God resting on the seventh day. God creating a, a perfect world and putting man to live in it. That is God's rest. God dwelling among men. I want you to turn to to one more spot in your Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 26. Turn to Leviticus chapter 26. I want you to see this in Leviticus. This is what God says to the people about his rest. About the land that he is preparing for them. Leviticus 26 verse 3. God says, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to carry them out, so he's saying, if you obey me, then, verse 4, I will give you rains in their season so that the land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Indeed, your threshing will last for you until grape gathering and grape gathering will last until sowing time. You will thus eat your food to the full and live securely in your land. God is promising that if they obey, In the land, they're going to have this lush, green paradise. Makes you think of the Garden of Eden. Verse 6, he says, I shall also grant you peace in the land, so you may lie down with no one making you tremble. I shall eliminate harmful beasts from the land, and no sword will pass through your land, but you will chase your enemies. They will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand And your enemies will fall before you with the sword. So God is saying, not only does the the land produce, there's going to be peace. You're going to be a world power. And then he goes on to say, verse 9, So I will turn toward you and make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will confirm my covenant with you. Remember, all of this is conditioned on verse 3. If you walk in my statutes, if you keep my commandments, Verse 11, he says, Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. 
I will also walk among you, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. God says that he will be with his people. He will actually be among his people. You think about Adam walking with God in the garden. That's the promise here that God is making to his people. He's saying, if you are these people that obey, that follow my commands, this is what the land is. It's not just a a nice place to live. God is actually promising to dwell with his people, to be among them. That's, That's the promise. That's when God says, you will not enter my rest. He says, you will not dwell with me. That's what the land promise was, God dwelling with his people in this land. When we looked at Exodus 17, verse 7, the end of that, of that passage, it said, they tested God and they said, is the Lord among us or not? His presence is what they questioned. They were questioning if God was with them. You see, the wilderness generation was not compelled by God's presence. God is saying to them, they, they did not want me as God. I'm not going to let them enter the land where I will be present with them, where I will dwell with them, if they don't enjoy my presence now. They question if God is among them. What will change in the land? You see, they want the land. The people wanted freedom from oppression. They want gardens. They want crops. They want cattle. They want milk and honey. But they don't want God. They want all the good things that he provides them. They want all the benefits of God. But for someone that just says, I want God for his benefits to me, that person does not love God. They love themselves. That's what God is saying. You don't actually love me. You're just looking at what I can do for you. That's a God made in man's own image. I used this analogy uh, with the, the students a couple of weeks ago. But just imagine I'm having a, a conversation about my wife and I say, I really love my wife. Really appreciate her. Really love her. I love the way that she takes care of our kids. I love how she cooks. She does my laundry. She cleans up after me. She's so great. And I just don't really love spending time with her. I don't really like being around her. But I love all these things she does. You would ask the question. It would be fair to ask the question. Do you love your wife or do you just love yourself? Do you just love what she does for you? And that's the issue here for this wilderness generation. They love what God can do for them, but they don't actually love God. When it comes down to it, they don't trust him. You see, God had a purpose in all of this. He was sustaining them in the wilderness. He was preparing them so they could be a humble people, so that he could dwell among them. And they were not satisfied with him. He says, you wanted rest, but you didn't want my rest. You wanted rest apart from me. God is saying, if he is not enough for you now, what will change? Circumstances are not going to change your heart. Or to say it this way, if you aren't satisfied with God now, if you don't love God now, if he's not your hope and your joy and your peace in this life, why would you think that he would be satisfying to you in the life to come? To think that, that God just gives me what I want. That's what, that's what they thought. God is just going to give me what I want. They didn't actually love God. Think about Revelation chapter 5 in your Bible. You have the multitudes of people surrounding the throne, praising the Lamb Jesus who was slain. That's what heaven is. It's worship of God. Worship from a heart. People who have been transformed. People who love God. People who are not worshipers now are not going to enjoy heaven. They're not going to want to be with God in heaven worshiping if you're not a worshiper today. One pastor said it this way. He said, those who want heaven only for relief will not be there. We want heaven. We want God's promises because God is there. Because he is our treasure. The reason we want heaven is because Jesus is in heaven right now. The reason that the people should have wanted the land is because God was promising to dwell with them in the land. So how would you know? How would you know if you enjoy God's presence today? How would you know if you are one who who wants to be with God, who wants to commune with God. Well, that's what the the psalm tells us. How would you know? Here's the barometer. What do you do with his word today? What does your obedience look like today? Do you believe what he says? This psalm is not about trusting in yourself. It's not about 
trusting a little more in yourself. I just got to work a little harder. I got to try a little harder to obey. This is looking to the rock of our salvation. Think about what it would look like for the Israelites to obey God's command. God commanded them to possess the land. They show up in Kadesh Barnea. What would it look like for them to obey? It would look like faith. They would have had a trust that God is going to protect us. It was not self-reliance. It would have been the the complete opposite of self-reliance, trusting that God was going to protect them from all these nations. That's what faith is, is trusting in what we don't see. And the one that has faith in God obeys. They press on in obedience. So this passage in the Psalms, this is a warning to us. Today, if you hear his voice, to hear God's word, to see his work, to have access to the Bible in our language, to have it sit on our shelves, to be unmoved by it. There's a warning to respond today in faith. But it's also a call of hope. Think about today. You still have opportunity today to hear God's voice. You still have access to God's word today. You could come to this room. You could come to church with parents. You could come with friends. You could sit here week after week, hear God's word, know the right answers to say, but in your heart not be a worshiper. And God says, today, do not harden your heart. Respond in humble faith. These words are also an encouragement to us, an encouragement to press on, to be worshipers in our hearts, to praise God's character, to marvel at his mercy, to walk one day at a time in humble faith in his promises. Would you pray with me as we close? God, we thank you so much for your word We thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. We thank you that you save sinners, that you actually came to this earth, Jesus, to die in the place of sinners. We who grumble, complain, we who want to find joy and happiness in anything besides you, Lord, and you still sent your son to die for those who rejected you so they could have eternal life, so they could enjoy your presence forever, Lord. Pray that Grace Bible Church, the men and women here, would be those who are marked by obedience because they love you, because they want to serve you with joyful hearts. Pray these things, Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen.